if God chooses this to open my eyes to see angels, that's fine. I don't need to see them, amen? The supernatural lifestyle is not an irresponsible lifestyle. Today, I'm going to be speaking on supernatural lifestyle, which is the topic we've been looking at this morning, um, this month, all month long. And this, the last Sunday, we'll be um, examining this topic before we move on to the month of May. And um, I really just want to speak and communicate to your heart today in such a way that um, you will know that the supernatural lifestyle is the lifestyle you've been created to live. Um, on Friday, I was at a celebration of life ceremony for a, a hero of faith of mine. His name is Dr. Jerry Savell. I just, it was a day's trip. I went in the morning, came in the evening. Um, he passed away the 15th of April. Um, two Mondays ago, and it was quite a, it was quite a, um, quite a shock, really, um, quite a shock. And I didn't realize how much he had impacted my life, you know, until he passed, which happens many times, you know. Many times we take things for granted, people, you know, and their influences on our lives for granted until we, it's no, it's no more, right? I mean, but thank God for you know, recorded messages, thank God for social media, thank God because of um, the footprints they've left behind that can continue to bless us. Um, but it dawned on me that, uh, you know, this man's life has been impacting mine for many years, for over 25 years, really. I remember over 25 years, actually, more like 27 years, you know? I remember a book of his that I read many years ago, in 25 years ago, when it was first released. It's a book titled "The Footsteps of uh, In the Footsteps of a Prophet." And even as of that time, of course, I knew I was going to marry my husband, and I knew we were going to be in ministry. Um, but there were a lot of details about that plan that I didn't have yet. Um, but that book prepared me for the honor in ministry, you know, the reverence for the anointing, and even more practically, um, out a protocol department of a church how to run more than anything. And I didn't even know uh, that I was being prepared for that. Um, the influence of his ministry, I mean, continues to till today as you know, it's um, in so many different aspects of my life. I thank God that um, God got me to connect, uh, to be closer to the ministry through uh, my dear friend, Terry Savell Foy, who has been here a few times. And that's the closest I ever got to him. But you know what? You meet a person's child, a person's offspring, and you get influenced by a person's offspring. You know, you get a piece of them as well. So I'm very grateful to God um, for that and for that opportunity. And grateful for the life of his servant, Jerry Savell, and the impact he has made on our lives. And if not on your life directly, I want you to know he has made an impact on your life through the pastors of this church. Amen. So I want to talk about a supernatural lifestyle. Um, so, a supernatural lifestyle is the lifestyle of the believer. Let's talk about what it is not, okay? A supernatural lifestyle is not a spooky lifestyle, okay? Um, there are a lot of spooky saints who spook, do spooky things in the name of being either supernatural or spiritual. The supernatural lifestyle does not mean that you are just spooky and weird. And, you know, nobody can ever understand you. You're always doing just strange things in the name of the Lord. Mm. A supernatural lifestyle is not, a spectac it's not necessarily a spectacular lifestyle. 
Sometimes believers miss the supernatural in search of the spectacular. They're always wanting something so, so big and so, you know, so extraordinary to happen. Somebody wants to see an angel all the time. You know, you want to wake up and have encounters with angels every day. You want, before you do anything, you want something, you know, just spectacular to happen. It's a very, very dangerous way to live because the devil can entertain you. Amen? There are many things in the realm of the spirit. It's not just God there. Mm-hmm. Someone says, I'm in the spirit. I'm in spirit. What spirit are you in? <laughs> there are many things in the realm of the spirit. And sometimes when people are too... As to as seeking the spectacular and too hungry for the spectacular, they entertain devils. Amen. You know, I don't need to see angels for them to walk in my life. They are welcome to work without me seeing them. I don't need to be spotting one every at every corner. Now, if God chooses to open my eyes to see angels, that's fine. I don't need to see them. Amen. If I need to be delivered from a fix, I just need the deliverance and then to thank God that he released angels according to how he has promised in his word to get that situation sorted out. You know, I read a book. (laughs) There were some books I used to read when I was still new in my work with God. And, you know, books that would talk, go into details about demonic activity and demons And there was a particular author, she's a lady. I used to read her materials a lot. She'll talk about angels and how angels will come and sit with her and talk, talk, talk. And she will have, like almost every day, you know. I mean, I'm not one to say if it's true or not. But all I know is that if you look through the Bible, angels weren't just appearing anyhow. In fact, if you count the encounters of people with angels in the Bible, I think it's about 38. Amen. So angels weren't just appearing. and So this lady that's describing the angel, the angel is handsome. It was like, he was handsome. In fact, that's even dangerous. By the time you are describing and you are saying he's handsome and he's coming to visit you every day, I hope you don't fall in love with this angel, you know? (laughs) I remember then, uh, then I'll read, and then I think the same lady will talk about demons and stuff like that. Thank God for delivering me from some really dangerous materials. I remember, and so it's about the time I just started attending um, the first installation of this ministry. Victory, it was called Victory Christian Fellowship. It was later that it was changed to Kingswood um, Christian Fellowship, and then... God did mighty things from then. I mean, of course, I didn't know I was going to be marrying the person I'm married to now. Um, He was just my pastor, amen. But he was a pastor who didn't let you just play around with dangerous things. He loved you enough to correct you and correct you swiftly. So that day he had come to visit me and he saw these three books, you know, on my table or whatever. One of them, pigs in the parlor. Another one, so, 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 another one. Three books. And he looked at that book. The one, pigs in the parlor, was about demonic activity and, you know, how you need to be make, making sure every day you are not possessed of a devil, you know, because there could be pigs in your parlor, right? So he said, pigs in whose parlor? <laughs> that was all he needed to say. And he put on a face. That was all he needed to say for me to see how ridiculous what I was reading was. Pigs in whose parlor? I'm possessed of the Holy Ghost. Why is a demon coming from that? I'll be examining myself every day. Is there a demon there with the Holy Spirit cohabiting in the same person? That's not possible. I just said pigs in whose whose parlor. And he dropped it. Thank God for deliverance. You should listen to your pastors. Amen. You should listen to your pastors. And you should come to church. Where's the camera? You should come to church. See, because some things your pastor can't see unless he sees you. 
You know, I was listening to somebody and she made a statement. She said, Paul said that I long to see you. Okay? That I'm coming in the fullness of the spirit and I long to see you. He didn't say I long for you to see me. So you may be online seeing me, but I don't see you. You know, there are times where I've been preaching and God has led me to give certain examples just because I caught sight of somebody and by the spirit of God, I just knew I needed to go in a direction. Amen? Because when you are ministering, you are, I'm not ministering by myself, I'm ministering by the Holy Ghost. So there are times I'm ministering and then I suddenly, I suddenly share an example. It could be an example from my life. It could be an example from somebody else's life. It could be an experience. And I know the reason why I'm sharing it is because I set eyes on someone and something prompted something in me because I saw them. I don't see you. Thank God for online. Thank God you'll be blessed. But there's something scriptural about appearing and showing up. Let your pastor see you. Amen. Sometimes you bump into someone you've not seen in a long time and they're like, and you're like, oh my God, I've not seen you in a long time. And they tell you, oh, we've been seeing you, we've been seeing you online. Thank God it was good when it was good and it's still good when it's good. But if you're in Chicago land, make your way to church. Am I preaching? Yeah. yeah. Make your way to church. Anyway. The supernatural lifestyle is not a spectacular lifestyle. The supernatural, it's not a lifestyle that's constantly seeking the spectacular, okay? The supernatural lifestyle is not an irresponsible lifestyle. Amen? Okay? You don't budget, you don't plan your spending, you spend money anyhow, and then it's the 29th. You don't know how you are going to pay rent on the 30th. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, I have faith. Just pull it out, you know, as fire insurance. Something that would bail me out of irresponsibility. Now, God is merciful. Now, I'm not saying this so that you don't pray when you find yourself in a situation and you've created a mess, right? God is merciful. But you know something about mercy? Mercy is the, at the discretion of the person who shows it. Okay. Do you know that if you get thrown out of your house, yeah, you get evicted, you won't die. Hmm? Okay? You won't die. And if you then because of that, you show up at a shelter and live in a shelter for a little while. It won't kill you. That could still be mercy. Uh -huh. mm. <laughs> but I'm sure it's not one that you desire, right? <laughs> so God is merciful. Uh, that's an extreme situation. Well, God is merciful, but um, the supernatural lifestyle is not, you know, an excuse for irresponsibility. Or indiscipline either. The supernatural lifestyle is not an indisciplined lifestyle, you know. Because you are living a supernatural lifestyle, you don't, because of that, be the last person to show up at work. Work started at 8 a.m. And you consistently show up at 9 a.m. with an excuse every time. And as you are driving, you are praying your boss doesn't see you. It's like, in the name of Jesus, I command that boss, don't see me. I'll walk in, I'll walk out. And then at 4.30, you want to leave. You know, supernatural lifestyle is not for indiscipline. It's not a lifestyle of indiscipline. Where you, we ask God to come and just help us maintain our lack of discipline. You know, that's not what the supernatural lifestyle is for. And it's some of these things that make, you know, when we are talking about the supernatural, we're talking about walking by faith, we're talking about the power of the word, we're talking about the things of the spirit. It's some of these spooky, irresponsible things that we may do sometimes as believers that makes it seem like what we are just um, talking about is a crutch, you know, for an if efficient life, which is not. Amen. All right. So, Man is a supernatural being, born again, not born again, you know, no Christ, don't know Christ. Man is a supernatural being. 
Because man was created as a spirit. Man has a uh, body component to him. He has a soulish component to him. He has a mind. He has intellect. He has emotions. But man is first and foremost a spiritual being. Even an unbeliever is a spiritual being. All right? To be spiritual means that you were created for a realm that's not just natural. It's not just on the natural. Many times we just live our lives very, very dead into the spirit world. And as a result, we are dead into the supernatural world. Amen. Which actually the supernatural you can see from the name itself. It's like there's a natural and then there's a super, a world that's above the natural. Okay. But unbelievers too are supernatural beings. In fact, there are some unbelievers who have mastered commun communing with the spirit world much more than the believers who have the life of God and have access to God in that space. You know, you have people who are playing with stuff in the spirit realm because man is a supernatural being. You know, I was just reading something. Something came up on my Instagram feed either this morning or yesterday about somebody who was, um, who's been, I think he's on trial right now. I don't know if any other person saw it, who's on trial right now. Or maybe it's old news. I don't know. It just came up and that he had been sacrificing um, young girls to Satan. It was in Africa. It was here. Amen. Because sometimes when we think about this thing, we think Africa. We talk about witches. We, talk, we think Africa, you know. We talk about wicked people who wield supernatural things for wicked things. And we first think, oh, you know, we talk, think about demonic activity. We think, ah, yes, the dark continent of Africa. Demons are everywhere. Amen. Can I repeat that again? Demons are everywhere. As parents, I advise you, as your children are growing old, you know, as they are growing, make them aware that there are demons, there are angels, there are demons, there's a spirit world. Amen? It's to their advantage. So if they are seeing somebody they call a friend acting one kind, they can discern, is this flesh, is this stupidity, is this demonic? Amen? Because whereas we are treating kids like they are too young to understand some things, the devil isn't respecting them like that. Anyway. So, you know, this guy they said was sacrificing, was killing people. I think he's a serial killer. He was a serial killer before he was arrested. And I think maybe in talking to him, they found, I didn't read it in TJ, I just saw the headline that he said he was actually sacrificing the blood to Satan. You know, some people will read that and just laugh, oh, oh, oh he's crazy. Mm. Amen. Anyway, I'm not here to talk about devils and demonic activity, uh, which I called because um, I say this, that, you know, there's something about casting out devils that, if there's anything that opens your eyes to the spirit world, is casting out a devil. And casting out a devil is not something that's reserved for special believers. Amen. It's not something that's reserved for special people. There are some people in our lives that we could help by saying, look, come, let me pray for you. All this trouble you keep sharing with me every time. There's something called devils. Let me tell you, there's something called devils. There are something called, there are things called demons. And one of them may be disturbing you right now. Like, no, 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 don't be scared. Don't be scared. You know, I'm just here to help you out and pray for them and cast out that devil. You would have helped them more than 30 hours of counseling can. Amen. All right. 
So man is a supernatural being. Uh, even a non-believer is just that in his spirit until he's born again. But he can be in tune with the spirit realm. When you do get born again, your spirit is alive. And you can live a supernatural lifestyle. Let's open our Bibles to the book of John chapter 3. And I'm going to read from verse 5 to 8. It says, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So it's everyone who is born of the Spirit. Amen. So Jesus said here that there's a fleshly born. You were born once and that was the birth of your flesh. But then there's a birth of your spirit where life is given to your spirit, where you can become alive to God. And that's what happens when we get born again. Being born again is not just an adoption of a religion. Being born again is not signing up to be a part of a church. Being born again is not that you were, you were sprinkled with water or you were baptized when you were a baby, before you understood anything. Being born again is not in the, it leads to external things and external changes, but it's first and foremost, something, a significant event that happens on the inside, which is that you are born and you become alive to God. You become alive in the spirit realm. You have the life of God in you. That's why I tell people, don't go and get married to somebody who, who is not born again. Just because they have good values, just because they act well, just because they are unlikely to beat you. Amen? Don't go and get married to somebody who is dead inside. You are alive to God. That's the most important part of your being your status with God, amen? Your status in the spirit world, in the spirit realm. The fact that the life of God is on your inside, that's the most important thing about you. That's the most important thing about us. Apostle Paul said something. He said, henceforth, we know no man after the flesh. You know, we focus on how we know people on the flesh so much, you know? So much of the time. But there's a deeper knowing, a deeper connection, a deeper fellowship that's based on our status. Are you dead? Am I alive? Am I alive and you are dead? Amen? Do I have life in me and you have no life? So when we get born again, the life of God is on our inside. We become alive to him. Now, let me talk about what a supernatural lifestyle now is. First of all, you're a supernatural being. And you are not just a supernatural being. You're a supernatural being with the life of God in you. And living beneath that is limiting yourself. Let's talk about what a supernatural lifestyle is. Because for a supernatural lifestyle, there's a God part. God is going to be God. Is God in the life of the unbeliever? Is God in... Is God as far as, you know, how do I put it now? Uh, is God towards, and please take this in context, is God towards the unbeliever, is God towards the believer. So God is always going to be God. So God is always going to be God who dwells in a realm where he can influence the natural from the spiritual. Okay, so we see God in operation even in the Old Testament even with people who weren't born again, because it's always going to be God, right? But there is then the supernatural lifestyle of the believer, which is based on the fact that the believer now has the same life in him or life in her that God has, okay? So I'm going to talk about supernatural lifestyle from both angles. Hopefully I get to it. 
Firstly, a supernatural lifestyle is one that realizes that God can interfere with the course of nature if he needs to in order to fulfill his word. Okay? God can interfere with the course of nature if needed so that he can fulfill his word. In my life, okay? You know, um, people talk about when we read accounts in the Bible of supernatural things, miraculous things, and people debate them like, no, it didn't really happen that way. Some people outrightly say it never happened. Some people go ahead to try to make, you know, um, some meaning out of it, bring it down to the natural um, level to explain how it could have without any um, introduction of any external force or spiritual force, how it could have happened, you know? People debate if something like the Noah's Ark ever could have happened because we think about it in our minds, how could so many animals, you know, be together in one place? The lion would have eaten the two goats, amen, for dinner the first day. We think about that with our natural mind. Uh, we say, okay, did it happen? You know, because of that, some people conclude that the Bible is just a book that we read is full of symbols, that the things didn't really happen. It's just symbolic things that at the end of the day, the most important thing you need to get from the Bible are the moral code, the things you can learn morally to be a better person. But people talk like that. People talk like, I mean, how could Jonah be in the belly of a whale, you know, uh, for three days? And then we try to ex to think about it, you know, you know, maybe this word, maybe it's maybe it's figurative. Yeah, there are some things, a lot of figurative things in the Bible, a lot of figurative things in the Bible. But people go as far as to debate miracles that it could not have happened. So it must have been figurative. Try to explain things away. Try to explain that um, the uh, Moses part in the Red Sea, you know, that that part of the Red Sea was very, very low. It was a season where it was very, very low and they could just have walked across it. You know, there's no way that the Red Sea could have just parted and become solid on both sides for people to walk in. People, you know, make all those kinds of debates and sometimes even believers do so. You know, it's believers that now say, oh, it's all figurative. Figurative. Somebody said something that really stuck with me. He said, you know, when someone was debating, I think he's an apologist, he said, what, you know, people tell me many of these things are figurative, you know. He said, I don't have any problems believing anything in the Bible to either be, to be an actual miracle or if it's figurative or if it's an actual miracle. Why? Because I already believed the most impo impossible thing. What was the most impossible thing? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. I already believe that. If you're a Christian, I hope I, you better believe. <laughs> if you're a Christian and you are telling me it's figurative, we need to examine your salvation and it's for your own good. So that at the end of the day, when you, you know, when you die and you're expecting to go up and you're like, ah, this is not looking like up. It means that you thought you were a believer, but you were never saved. And it's very important. Many people think they are believers. I'm not talking about works now. I'm talking about people never coming to the place where they come to the conviction that Jesus died and he paid the price for my sin and he rose again the third day and I accept that work of redemption. If the death, burial of, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is still symbolic in your mind, you are not saved. Amen. If you call any other thing symbolic in the Bible, you can't dare not call that symbolic because there's no way you can be saved without believing that Jesus died, he was buried, he resurrected, and I resurrected with him. And in doing so, he paid the price for my sin so that when I appear before God, I'm not appearing based on my own merits, but on the finished work of redemption. You can come to church, do everything in church. It's unlikely you can keep coming to this church and not realize it, but you can go to church 
do everything, you know, in church, but without that personal conviction, I'm sorry. You still need the salvation experience. Amen. Anyway, I said that to say, say this, that as a believer, you already believed. The most ridiculous, most impossible thing that God created, this heaven and earth we see out of nothing. What else is difficult to believe after that? Amen? If I can believe the most impossible thing, then I can believe any other thing in God's word. All right? Okay. So, you know, I said a supernatural lifestyle in, is one in which God needs to, God will interfere with the course of nature if he needs to in order to fulfill his word. In interfering with the course of nature, it may be an orchestration of just time and chance. But there are some miracles that can be explained that way. For example, when Abraham was taking Isaac to go and sacrifice him, God had told Isaac, um, sacrifice your son, your only son. And Abraham had carried Isaac, um, took him, and as they were, Climbing up uh, Mount Moriah. And Isaac got there. First of all, it took a lot of training up a child in the way he should go. For Isaac to have agreed, not just to climb the mountain with his father, said, ask his father, I see the stick, I see everything. Where is the ram? His father said God will provide. Maybe he was thinking, well, God will certainly provide. That's okay. That's okay. I can, I can take that. I can accept that. And then you finally get to the top of the mountain. <laughs> Without an understanding of consecration, how can you get a full-grown man to lie down on an altar, fully intending to kill him? And Isaac didn't say, Daddy. Since we are sacrificing to God, you have lived your own life. How old are you again? <laughs> if you won't get on it, I will get you there. And he was lying there. And the Lord said, you know, Abraham, don't kill your son. And he showed him the ram he had provided in the ticket. How did that ram get there? It could have been put there, right there and then, by God. It could have been a ram that got lost from a herd and just wandered there somehow. But one way or the other, the supernatural lifestyle says, however God needs to get it there, in order to fulfill his word, he will get it there. Either breaking through the course of nature and disrupting things for me. Or just working things out. Time, chance, coming together. God will do what he needs to do to get his word fulfilled in my life. You know, something happened to me many years ago. Um, that was uh, then, I mean, it's still, I'm still in awe of it. But recently I was looking at certain things and I saw that, you know what? There were natural things that could have led to it. There was a very clearly supernatural part, but there were certain things that I didn't understand at that point that recently I started saying some things that, some natural things that could have led to um, that occurrence. Some of you have heard this story before. Uh, Maybe many of you. You know, um, when, we, when I came to Chicago and I was looking for a job, looking for a job, looking for a job, anyway, finally I revamped my resume. Um, that's another story of the leading of God. I revamped it and then I turned it into this, I sent it to this agency, this recruiting agency. 
And then about a couple of weeks later, they called me back and said that a company wanted to interview me for a particular position. The position had the name of the technology they expected the person to have in it. And there was no way in my resume that that technology was specified. I'd never heard of it before. I'd never seen it before. I was like, and this was my very first real job in Chicago. So of course I was like excited, but at the same time baffled, at the same time wondering if they made a mistake and everything. But they said they wanted to interview me. I'm like, okay. So they, um, they said they would call me, the company would call me two hours later. Two hours later, they didn't call me. Then four hours after that, I got a call back from the agency. And they said that the company said that they don't need to interview you anymore. They want you to come and start work on Monday. My husband and I looked, is it a real company? <laughs> Let me tell you, it, we have a, hmm. there's a reason why we asked that because you know, I'd been so desperate on this finding a job thing in Chicago that one time I, you know, I got a call from a company and they said they wanted to interview me. So we went, they, we got there, I got there. My husband too was excited, you know, we're both excited. We got there and it was at one building near the hotel, near the airport. The building's a skyscraper. It's a tall building. And I think they were like on the seventh floor. So we, I went in, and then I got to the lobby. They had a part of a wing of, this, of the floor. So I got there. There were other people who were, being inter who were sitting there waiting to be interviewed. There must have been about 10 of us, you know, waiting. We sat down. Then the interviewer came out, took me to the place to get interviewed. And they did the same. You know, it was kind of started, did the same for the other people that had come in. So went, got interviewed. You know, the interview was kind of not specific, it was just general, but I'm like, anyway. So we got interview. I came out, when I came out, there were new people who were waiting to be interviewed. I'm like, this company must really be hiring a lot of people. So anyway, they gave me this software. They gave me, they said, okay, you're gonna know, you need, we need you to brush up on this skill before you start working with us, software. And then they said something. They said to cover materials, everyone needs to pay. $300. To show you how desperate I was, I went into the can, told my husband, I said, you know, I mean, they need us to lend this, this, but we need to pay $300. You know, they told me I could go, think about it, and bring back the check. So we wrote the check, I took it back to them, paid $300, then went home. I said, give me three weeks to learn and come back three weeks so that I could start work. I studied, this thing made no sense, this soft, so-called software, but I'm like, okay, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm just the one who doesn't understand. I studied, studied, read, researched. You know, those days Google wasn't as good as it is now. But I was trying my best, trying to just understand this before three weeks' time. You know, that same day I met somebody, then we became acquaintances. So we were study pals. We we're just talking. And then I was talking to the person. His background was very different from mine. I'm like, how can we be getting hired for the same job? I'm like, no, just keep studying. After three weeks, so I started, close to the three weeks, I started sending them email. Um, when should I come? Blah, 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 no response. Like, what's going on? After three weeks, I got in my car, ready to resume work, got to that seventh floor, and it was bare. I quickly did my mental calculation. 10 people every hour for eight hours, for three weeks, because they must have done it for three weeks, because they sent us away to come back in three weeks. So they must have done it one, two, three. 10 people. 10 people every hour, $300 per, pe dollars per person, um, how many hours a day, times three weeks. I'm like, oh my God. Their name was Receiver Corporation. <laughs> True story, you can't make this up. So my husband and I started calling them Deceiver Corporation. And a few weeks later, we saw them in the news, right? They talked about these young guys who went about trading people for money. I felt so foolish, so stupid. But anyway, so when I got a call that a company wants to hire you without interview, we said, let's go and check. <laughs> so anyway, we went there, found out it was a true company. So on my way back, I bought the dummies book. And I studied that book. 
uh, started studying. I'm like, I'm starting work on Monday. I have no clue what the subject is about. So I started studying, studying. I think Thursday or Friday, Thursday, I got a call from the recruiter on email. He said, oh, they said your desk isn't ready yet. Would you wait one more week? I said, is the Pope Catholic? <laughs> of course, I'll wait. Thank you. So I waited. I studied another one week. The following week, they called again. They said, your desk isn't still not ready. Where is this desk coming from? From China? Thank you very much. I'll study one more week. Then the following week, they sent me an email. Said they, are read, they said, you should read. They are ready for you. Resume on Monday. So I showed up on Monday. I had the dummies book in my bag just in case. I waited in the lobby. And then the controller came to meet me. She said, are you our, I mean, I'll say the name of the technology. Are you our crystal reports expert? I said, yes, ma'am. Said, come to your seat. Now, that was a miracle. It was super. Number one, the fact that one, then I saw the desk. I'm like, what kind, what? This desk looks like something they just, I mean, it was okay. It was this. I'm like, what's special about this desk? I took two weeks to prepare. But there was something supernatural about it. I, God needed to give me that delay so I could practice. Now, I didn't go sit down like, uh, God did it. He started it. He will finish this work. Man, credo, shtavala, di, karadishta, ha. And not study. And then they show up and then they say, Are you our crystal reports uh, expert? I'm like, Okay. Then I get to my desk. I'm like, Lord, you started this work. Show me. Tell me. Is it A? Do I click a plot? Do I click? That's what some believers do. God is doing the supernatural, but they are not cooperating with it. I mean, if I'd showed up with a very empty head, I would have been fired two weeks after. And then I'll go and cry to my pastor. Pastor, I thought God did it. Okay. So, but you know, it was very supernatural. First of all, getting hired without an interview, getting the job, and then they are like, don't start, don't start, don't start. Give me enough time to work. But you know one thing I found recently? For some reason, I happened to be searching up on that recruiting agency. I was just looking at them and looking at how they are doing their reviews and everything. And I saw over and over again, people complaining. They submitted my resume for a job I didn't qualify for. That I told them this is what I wanted, but they submitted and put me up for a job I didn't qualify. Many reviews, not one, many reviews. They put me up for a job I didn't qualify. They put me up for this company. Don't go with them. Don't go for them. They are very bad. They put me up. Then it dawned on me that these people put me in, and they must have made a, put a very convincing word in that, you know, this is a strong candidate for this position, even though I did not have a clue. It ended up being a great setup because that was what starting a company and all that, revamping my career and everything was based on. What am I talking, what am I saying here? That was a natural part to it. And sometimes the supernatural, it's God moving things. Whereas all these other people were complaining, right? God found a way to use a dubious agency, amen, because, I mean, if you are submitting people for, to work out a miracle, work out the supernatural in my life, amen? So sometimes we're very calculated with our lives, how, how I see God is going to do it. This is what I think God will do. This is how I think God will move. Your mind is not big enough. Amen. That's, that's why a supernatural lifestyle involves cooperating with God and let, telling yourself, especially when you are stuck, stop trying to figure it out. You've thought about it from A to Z. You've gone back Z to A. You know, you started from the middle, gone from J to A, um, K to Z. You've not figured it out. Your mind is not big enough. But there's still a God. Amen. And that's what a believer, that's how a believer lives and thinks. That with God on my side, I'm never stuck. I'm of, I live a supernatural lifestyle. So when the natural, when I get to the end of the rope, natural wise, I keep going. What people call the end of the road is not the end of the road for me. Amen. Because God is able to utilize the resources that I see and the resources I don't see. 
on my behalf. That is God's part. But there is your own part of being sensitive to the supernatural. Amen? Because many times as believers, we are so natural. We are natural in the way we see things. We are natural in the way we think. You know, the council we build around us is all natural. Only people who will emphasize the natural. You know, we're natural in the way we act. We're natural in the way we react. We are so natural in the way we process things. Amen. And because of that, many times we're not even sensitive to the spirit of God anymore. We're not sensitive to what God wants to do, what God wants to say. We're not sensitive to the Holy Spirit on our inside. We are so confident in our ability to reason things out. And you know, sometimes what God is leading us to do may be totally different from what we are thinking. Do you know that God has a plan? Let me tell you something about God. He's very opinionated. <laughs> He's very opinionated. He has opinions. And he's very strong on his opinions. See how much he wrote about it. But sometimes we want to walk with God as if we are, we are, we are walking with, you know, the way you have a yes, yes um, employee who has to say yes to everything. Just yes. God, all you need, all I need you to do huh, in this relationship is I present it to you and you stamp it with your yes. No matter what it is. I want to marry that guy, yes. What date do you want for the wedding? You want a destination wedding? You know, those are the kind of questions we want God to ask us. After all, it will give us the desires of our hearts. Lord, I want to marry that guy. It's that guy. I don't care if he's born again. I don't care if he believes in going to church. I don't care if he has any accountability around him. He's that guy. Why? He's tall. He's dark or light. He's handsome. He has a good job and a good car. Makes for a good Instagram picture. And then we'll go get married in Hawaii. Then we present it. That, some, that's what people, many believers call prayer. Presenting plants in front of God. Like he has no opinion. No thoughts. He doesn't process. He's just here to stamp it. Say yes. And send you merrily on your way. We don't like to hear that part. We don't like to hear no. That's not my plan. We don't like to. Amen. Hey, I don't blame you. I don't like to hear no myself. I don't. Nobody does. But if you are going to walk with God, and if you are going to walk in the supernatural, you are going to be prepared for a God who has something to say. A God who has a response. A God who has a will for you. You know, you can have a friend with a will, but you're like, look, it's your will. Oh, you want to, oh, you want to go somewhere? I don't want to go with you. Fine, go. Your will is your will. Your decision is your decision. It doesn't affect me. But you have a God whose will. <laughs> In, who intends that his will controls your life. And that's a bitter pill for many people to swallow. Amen. Amen. But a fulfilling walk with God will involve submission to his will. And that, my friends, is part of the supernatural lifestyle. Amen. You know me. If you don't feel, if you listen to me and you don't feel Tom weeping on the inside, I've not preached, right? Something that will make you feel like maybe I should go and re-examine some things. Amen? I want to leave us with that today. We are called to walk in the supernatural. And to walk in the supernatural 
we walk closer and closer and closer and closer with God. Amen? Closer and closer and closer with God. Like God, to do your will is, to, is my desire. And then it becomes a beautiful harmony. The Holy Spirit can speak to you. And he will bother speaking to you because you will listen. Why should he speak to you when you won't listen anyway? But there is a lot he has to say about the different areas of our lives. And it's good, you know. Can I think he said something? He said that, you know, walk in the light that you know. You know, walk in the light that you know. Or how did he put it? Okay, he said that he was reading the Bible. And I think the Holy Spirit was dealing with him about something. And he felt it was something. It was about worry that he was a chief warrior. And then he read the Bible, and the Bible said, don't be anxious for nothing. And he closed it. And he wouldn't read, he couldn't read it again for a while. Anyway, I may be getting the details wrong, but just stick with me. And he said that until he went back and he committed to doing it, it's like things just became dark. Like, he couldn't have any more light until he crossed that hurdle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we want to hear God. We want God to speak to you, to us, and we want to walk with the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, we have to also, you know, be yielded to him. All right? As much as I know God, I will be yielded to you and to your will and what you are saying. And that's part of the supernatural lifestyle. Let me read a scripture to us and then um, we will, I'll, as I bring my message to a close. Um, in First John chapter 2, verse 20. First 2, 20, it says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Amen. Let's, let's read another one in First John chapter 2, verse 27. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and it's not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. And one of the, um, the reason, don't let me say one, the reason why Jesus, after he left, felt a need to ask the Father that he might send the Holy Spirit, that he might abide with us forever, is because we need him for the supernatural lifestyle. We need him to live above the natural. And you know, when you get saved, you have a measure of the Holy Spirit. And then when you get filled with the Spirit, you have an even greater measure. And over here, this scripture talks about this anointing, which is the influence. You have that anointing because you have the Holy Spirit. That it will teach you all things. All right? And you have no need that anyone teach you. Now, of course, the same Spirit of God that put this in the Bible also puts the fact that um, when Jesus ascended on how he gave gifts to men, and one of the gifts he gave was teachers and pastors and preachers and evangelists and apostles. So this scripture is not talking about you don't listen to anybody because you know God for yourself. Amen. But it's talking about your day-to-day -day living. And it doesn't mean that you don't open yourself to counsel, right? But you know there's a way that you can be so crippled as a believer that Unless somebody tells you A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you don't know what to do. You are always confused. You never know what to do. You need a friend. You need this person to, to tell you exactly what to do at every point in time. But what the Bible, the scripture tells you that you have an anointing from the Holy One. And you know how to live because of that anointing. Because that anointing means to walk with you or aims to, let me put, aims to walk with you and work with you through life. There are certain things that get you stumped, certain situations that get you baffled, that you just need to pause and say, I have an anointing from the Holy One. Amen? I cannot be confused. 
I cannot be defeated. I know all things. I know what to do in this situation. I don't need to be an expert to know what to do. Amen? And because of that, I don't have to feel stuck. I don't have to feel like I can't undo my life. If you are here, you're at a point where you feel you cannot undo your life. Your life has become so convoluted and so confusing, you don't know how to handle it. I'll tell you today that you have an anointing from the Holy One. And you know all things. You know what to do in that situation. Have, a, have, some, have confidence in the one on the inside. The pastor may not be available 24-7. Amen. Your friend may not be available 24-7 for you. Your friend may even have gotten tired of your issues. But you have an anointing that never gets tired. Amen. It's like AI. You know, AIs are replacing people because they never get tired. And they don't make the mistakes that people make. Once they've been programmed with the data and they've been trained with the data to get the job done, they don't get tired after eight hours and say, I need to go home to see my babies. They keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. You have a system on your inside that keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. And you don't have to be confused. Please rise up to your feet. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory be to Jesus. I want you to just speak to the Lord. Hallelujah. Take a moment and just speak to him. I like to give people the opportunity to communicate back to God about whatever part of the message that they heard that struck with them. Amen. Glory to Jesus. Amen. Go ahead, speak to him. Just a few more moments. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The anointing will teach you how to raise your kids. To teach you. I know it gets difficult. <laughs> Especially between that age of 13 to about 20. Oh my gosh. Like what happened to my little, my little kid? But there's an anointing to help you navigate that season. The anointing will help you in your marriage. Like I married the wrong person. You know, we've all felt that, amen. But then we turn on to that anointing and we realize then, you know, we realize it's just a face. It's just human beings. We human beings being human beings. But then we, we lean on the supernatural, on resources that are available to us beyond the natural. And we find out how we can indeed go on and enjoy and thrive in this. Glory be to God. You are confused about your finances. You've walked yourself into a mess. You know, first of all, repent. You know, God forgives you, but doesn't leave you in your mess. There's an anointing in you that will help you unravel everything and figure it out. And if God needs a miracle to move things, change the course of nature, to make things right for you. That's available to you too. Father, we give you praise. Thank you because we are not limited to this natural world. We have access to greater. We have access to higher. We have access to better. We can go further because we are supernatural beings. We release ourselves from the limitations of the natural and we lean on the spirit realm, because we are spirit beings created in your own image and your own likeness. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We give you praise.